So, thank you very much, uh, Jockey, for your um, kind invitation. And it's great to be the inaugural speaker in this series. I feel very honoured. And um, I hope you're going to have some good uh, talks in it. Certainly really uh, cutting-edge subject, Christian social thought. I'd like um, you maybe just to indicate whether before you receive the invitation to tonight, you've ever heard of the person we're thinking about tonight, Abraham Kuyper. Can you put your hands up if you had actually heard of him before you were invited? Most of you, that's very impressive. So some of you haven't, so this talk is going to be a challenge because some of you will have heard of him, maybe read even some of his works, and some you've actually never heard of him until you're invited to this uh, event. But let me um, outline why I think he is worth knowing about. And we'll do that by uh, taking a brief look at his historical and intellectual significance. And then we'll take a look at his remarkable career and then at one of his ideas. And he had a lot, but we'll look tonight at one. Kuiper dominated the religious and political life of the Netherlands for nearly half a century. And because I'm a, an academic, I'm reading a paper. There's going to be loads of time for discussion afterwards, so hold on. And during his career, he achieved positions of eminence in a number of different fields. As a scholar, he established himself early in his career as an academic theologian and provided chief impetus towards the founding of the Free University a leading university with a Christian foundation based in Amsterdam. Marion here is actually from Holland, and she may have even studied at that university, or she's probably even visited it. Is that right? Yeah, I remember So we've got a real Dutch person here. <laughs> and, uh, the free university still stands in Amsterdam. It's a, a thriving university with a Christian foundation. As a journalist, he founded a daily newspaper and remained its chief editor for almost 50 years. As a politician, he organized the Anti-Revolutionary Party, a Christian-based popular people's party, and remained its leader for some 40 years, during which time he served a four-year term as prime minister, as he is in this photograph, <coughs> which is the one on the publicity, I think. And here he is chairing a cabinet meeting. You can just make him out here. It's another very sharp photo. <coughs> This is a cabinet meeting around him as Prime Minister, and uh, he was often the subject of cartoons, and this one says Abraham the Terrible. Uh, but there are much more daring cartoons, which I didn't want to show, but this one's fairly okay. <laughs> so, you know, nothing's new about as satire in national newspapers. And as a writer of devotional and religious literature, and he did this even as Prime Minister, writing daily devotionals, he launched a weekly religious journal and published scores of meditations and works of applied and pastoral theology. And as a church reformer, he led a revival of orthodox faith within the national church and later established a new confederation of reformed churches, which has vast numbers of sister churches all over the world. But there are more significant reasons than having had a distinguished career that make Kuiper worthy of attention to those interested in Christian social reform. One is that in virtually every area of his activity, he sparked off new developments. He's established, for instance, of the Anti-Revolutionary Party in 1879 along modern democratic lines, signaled the end of the liberal domination of Dutch politics and helped to make way for the rise of a more democratic and a representative form of government based on modern party organisation. Likewise, his founding of the Free University the following year stimulated a proliferation of a great number of social and educational institutions founded on Christian principles. In turn, this encouraged the development of, of two very significant socio-political phenomena principled pluralism and Christian democracy. And those two ideas are much more familiar to our continental Europeans than they are perhaps here in the UK. Kuiper's significance also lies in the fact that he represents an unusual blend of theological orthodoxy and cultural progressiveness. Although he sought a revival of traditional Calvinist religion, 
He did not advocate a return to pre-enlightenment conditions in the hope that this would help the cause of Christian civilization. He offered rather an alternative program for cultural and political renewal to that offered by the Enlightenment. An Enlightenment, he believed, that was having a damaging effect on European society at every level. With his persistent agitation for greater educational, social and political freedoms for minority groups, Kuiper stands out as a progressive and innovative leader. He was not content to confine himself to the sidelines of private and public morality issues that so often preoccupy Christian social engagement today, I have to say, but instead he tried to shape the entire structure of the socio-political order. And this in itself challenges the validity of the stigma often borne by Calvinism that it represents an otherworldly, backward-looking way of life of little relevance to contemporary society. It also challenges the prevailing um, bias in social sciences, in part due to the influence of Max Weber, that modernization always goes hand in hand with secularization. That seems to be the kind of uh, dogmatic norm that you diverge from at your peril, that modernization and secularization always go together. Kuiper's anti-revolutionary movement is striking evidence that although they may go together, they may also move in opposite directions. I think we're seeing something similar uh, with the enormous growth of Christianity in the global south as well. So Kuiper is significant for the remarkable success uh, that he achieved. When he began his public career in the 1870s, he became the leader of a marginalised minority group, but less than 10 years later, due in large part to his tireless activities, this same group was in possession of powerful journalistic organs, a socio-political programme, a political <coughs> party and a university. And 10 years after that, it found itself in the seat of power, taking part with Catholics in the first confessional cabinet of the Netherlands. And over the century that's ensued since the high point of Kuiper's career, the influence of his ideas has continued unabated through the existence of a worldwide Kuiperian or neo-Calvinist school of thought that's reflected in Kuiper's most famous saying. So if you've heard of Kuiper, you may have heard a saying of his which is just summarised here, that there is no square inch of human existence over which Christ, who is sovereign, does not proclaim, it is mine. I couldn't get all of it on the screen, <laughs> so you've got a summary. But uh, if you remember that idea, you've got to the heart of what Kuiper stood for and his significance as a Christian intellectual and a social reformer. But where did that vision and zeal for social and cultural reform come from? And this evening, I'd like to trace it back to three profoundly formative experiences he had as a young man. I think I've got one here as a young man. And uh, the first is his brush with the Oxford movement, the second with rural Calvinism, and the third with American revivalism. Quite a mixture. And each one, I think, is crucial to understanding Kuiper as a social reformer, and I'll cover them as briefly as I can. So first, the Oxford movement, largely through her friendship with the great poet <coughs> priest John Keeble, the writer Charlotte Young became a devotee of the Anglo-Catholic Oxford movement. Her novel, The Heir of Radcliffe, had such a deeply religious and moralistic tone that it reduced some of its readers to tears. And amongst those so affected was an aspiring young Dutch theologian in his late 20s who had recently completed a highly distinguished PhD dissertation in historical theology, the newly minted doctor Abraham Kuyper. And here he is on the day he received his doctorate. Again, apologies for the lack of sharpness. And as a student in Leiden, Kuyper had broken with his childhood faith and had become enamoured with the ascendant liberal theology. At the end of a lecture in which the bodily resurrection had been vigorously denied, he rose with his fellow students to give the lecturer a standing ovation. 
I broke with every form of faith, he wrote later about his time in Leyden, and I threw myself into the barest form of Russianism. And it was to Kuiper, the hard-headed, young, brilliant Russianist theologian, that Joanna, his fiancée, sent a copy of the book The Heir of Redcliffe. Here's the title <coughs> on page. Kuiper consumed the book with obsessive interest. It brought him to realise that despite the strength of his will and his enormous capacity for learning, he remained a weak and sinful person in need of God's, God's grace. That masterpiece, he wrote, was for me a means towards the breaking of my self-satisfied, contentious heart. He wrote to his fiancée, Joanna, after finishing the book, The heir of Redcliffe has done me good. I cried as a child and knelt to pray out of remorse. Things were not good with me. I had been too self-satisfied, too desirous of honour, too egoistic, not noble enough, not enough for a child of God. For years I had deceived myself and convinced myself that I was doing good. My conscience, my childlike heart lulled to sleep. I did not know what sin was anymore, and I knew no contrition. I was alone in my lodgings. I went upstairs and fell on my knees and prayed, long and fervently. I had not prayed like this for years. This is what I call Kuiper's ethical conversion. It brought him, by his own admission, face to face, with his shortcomings and his need of God's grace. That was the Oxford movement. The second key to unlock Kuiper as a social reformer is rural Calvinism. Soon after he finished reading The Heir of Redcliffe, Kuiper arrived, quote, inclining towards the gospel in the village of Baist, his first parish. It's still a small village. He came, he wrote, quote, less in order to give from what was mine than in the secret prayer that my empty heart might be refreshed and fed by the members of the congregation. We know some other great figures in, in history who were ordained without actually being converted. I think John Wesley counts as one of them, and maybe Martin Luther too. So here he is arriving in his first parish, hoping that he will pick up the spirit from his parishioners because he knows they won't get it from him. <laughs> and uh, here he is as a country parson. But at first he was disappointed with what he found. In the circles in which I moved, he wrote, there dominated not wanting to negate what was good, a strict conservatism, orthodox in tone, but without real glow, devoid of spiritual energy. People were happy with the things as they were. They wanted to receive from me but they gave me nothing in return. Kuiper soon heard, however, that there were some malcontents amongst his parishioners, who out of protest against his liberal theology refused to attend his services. He was warned by regular members of the congregation that these people were the sort that caused a nuisance to every minister and that he would do well to stay well out of their way. Instead, Kaiba was intrigued, and so with, quote, a trembling heart, in the course of my house visitation, I knocked on the doors of these enthusiastic members. His reception was far from congenial, and he was refused a handshake by a young woman called Beecher Baltus, the daughter of a poor labourer. Here's a picture of her when she was much older, but at that time she was a young woman. But despite their awkwardness and hostility, Kuiper felt a strong attraction to the malcontents and made a point of paying them regular visits. He later wrote, Here spoke a conviction. Here the people had richer resources for conversation than about 
beautiful weather or that so-and-so was ill or that such and such had sent away his servant. Here was interest in the spiritual dimension. Most of all, here was knowledge. Whereas in Leiden, Kaip had been praised by his professors for his exemplary diligence and outstanding results, in Beist he found himself sharply reproved by ordinary village people. They deemed him ignorant of the most basic truths of Christianity. With my poor knowledge of the Bible, he wrote, which I had acquired at the university, I could not measure myself up against these simple souls. He found amongst them a living expression of what he had previously only studied for academic reasons. Later he wrote, <coughs> those ordinary working people, hidden away in a corner, told me in their rough regional dialect the same thing Calvin had given me to read in beautiful Latin. Calvin could be found, however misformed, amongst those simple country folk who had hardly heard his name. He had taught in such a way that he could be understood even centuries after his death in a foreign country, in a forgotten village, in a room floored with tiles and with the mind of an ordinary labourer. In Beist, Kaipa discovered on his own admission that Calvinism was more than an historical and ecclesiastical phenomenon. It was a world of thought and a way of life that had dynamic and transforming potential. And what is more, it could be accepted and understood by humble, uneducated people. Having made this discovery, he underwent a second conversion, this time a theological one, emerging as the orthodox Calvinist he would remain for the rest of his life. From now on, his career would be dominated by the attempt to expound and apply the principles of Calvinism to the society and culture of his day. <clears throat> Can anybody remember what the third transformative experience is? The third stream that American, impacted the young... American, American, American yes. revivalism. American revivalism. That's our third hermeneutical key to Kaifa <laughs> as a social reformer. Not long after leaving parish ministry to become a member of parliament, if you became member of parliament, if you're a clergyman, you had to resign your orders because otherwise you're not allowed as a MP. So he uh, became an MP uh, after the election in 1875. Uh, and soon afterwards, uh, before it started to get busy, he visited England to attend a major prayer and revival conference in Brighton, led by the American evangelists Dwight Moody, Ira Sankey, and Robert Herschel Smith. The last of those is the one he particularly heard, and there is his picture. An American, um, nowadays maybe we call him a tele-evangelist. He drew the thousands, there were 8,000 in the conference that Kaifa attended. He was there for several days, and he was impressed with what he saw and heard. He wrote, Guilt and sin were never so deeply felt as there in the wonderful presence of the Lord. Hardly a single harsh word could be heard during those days amongst all those thousands of people. Differences melted away. <clears throat> there was love for one another. God's power revealed itself, not only around us, but in and through the soul. When members of the Dutch delegation Kuiper was in were asked to express their reaction to the conference in a sentence from scripture before leaving for home, Kuiper replied, my cup runneth over. He entertained high hopes of the influence of the Brighton conference to be perpetuated in the Netherlands. He wrote a series of articles in his weekly newspaper he founded on themes reflecting the tone and content of the conference. The last of these series ran only for a few weeks before it was suddenly terminated because Kuiper suffered a nervous breakdown. It's likely that overwork was the main cause. 
but for Kuiper, his Brighton experience was also a contributory factor, due largely to what he came to regard as its world-denying, pietistic, and highly subjective tendencies in the so-called holiness movement. Throughout the rest of his career, he spent a great deal of energy confronting those tendencies as obstacles to the life-affirming thrust of the Calvinist worldview. This he did with a barrage of theological concepts, most notably the doctrine of sphere sovereignty and the doctrine, and this is the one I want to talk about tonight, of grace. Time only allows us to look at this one idea, but it was a big idea, and he is known around the world as the theologian of common grace, so we're getting to the heart. For Kuiper, common grace was the root conviction of all reformed people, and he used it as an effective weapon against what he regarded as a dualistic conception of re regeneration, whereby Christ's redemption was conceived of only in terms of the salvation of the soul. Calvinism, Kuiper believed, had sought to emphasize the wide, comprehensive, cosmic meaning of the gospel. He often used the phrase cosmic redemption, not just redemption of the soul, the redemption of the <coughs> cosmos. And for him, the Calvinism had given honor and spiritual status to all temporal things such as science and the arts it had liberated religion from the confines of the church and had provided a powerful impulse to the development of Western society. Kaib was also keen to point out that it was in the 17th century Netherlands, which had witnessed a flowering of Calvinism, that the telescope, the microscope, and the thermometer were invented. I couldn't get the thermometer on mm. there, but there's two of them. And it, it was also, he would point out, where the modern republic was born and where great artists had been produced like Rembrandt and Vermeer. If he was visiting us here in Cambridge, he had no doubt be keen to remind us, I think, that it was 17th century Dutch engineers that drained the highly fertile agricultural land to the north of us called the Fens. And when he went to the USA, at the end of the 19th century to receive an honorary doctorate in law at Princeton and also to deliver his now world famous lectures and he's an unknown writer who's written a book on those lectures <laughs> uh, and to meet the President of the United States and to visit a number of uh, cities with large Dutch American populations like Grand Rapids he repeatedly emphasized the great religious and cultural legacy America had inherited from European Calvinists, and was putting it to good effect in building such a great nation as the United States. And if you're interested uh, in a book on those lectures, there it is, but it's 300 pages, so I don't particularly recommend it. But in contrast to particular grace, whereby God imparts salvation, common grace was the means by which God restrains the corruption of the world caused by sin and allows for the development of human life and culture. And this explains why thinkers such as Plato, Aristotle and Kant and Darwin were able, in his words, to, to, to shine as stars of the first magnitude. So a Calvinist, they're well known for believing in sin and they're pretty dour about sin. So how come we have fantastic culture, the arts and scientists and great thinking, that is where common grace uh, makes sense to in a Calvinist worldview. It explains how it is that God's great gifts are shed abroad, abroad amongst human beings, not just amongst Christians. For Kuiper, the doctrine of common grace, which he traced back to the uh, world and thinking of John Calvin, was the key to the cultural transformation that emanated from the Reformation and had still boundless transformative potential. The importance he attached to it is reflected in the massive three-volume book that he wrote on it. I love these kind of books between um, uh, the Netherlands and 
uh, England a lot of the time. They went round with me. This was all before the days of the internet. So I know how heavy these books are and how, <laughs> how enormously huge they are. Uh, and he wrote them quite often uh, over several years and first published them as articles and then put them together as a book. So um, the first volume of this uh, book, Common Grace, has just appeared, uh, newly translated into English, and there are many more translations of his works in the pipeline, like this one. I think this is coming out in the next few weeks. I don't know why it's got Yoki. <laughs> <laughs> I thought Piper wrote this book, but I know I'm saying you wrote it. I'm expecting royalties from it. <laughs> That's amazing. I don't know. <laughs> 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 well, stranger things can happen, I suppose. Explanation, please. Yeah, yeah, maybe. Yeah, subliminal messages. Yeah, so um, the, the collected works of uh, Kuiper is public. So there's never been a better time to learn about Abraham Kuiper than now. Because I had to read all this stuff in Dutch, but you can now read all of it in English. And they're adding to the collection of Kuiper books all the time. And uh, he lived well into his 80s, and he wrote for publication almost every day. There's some photos of him writing. Uh, that's a sketch of him writing, enjoying a bit of tobacco. The Dutch are famous for enjoying coffee, but they were famous also for enjoying tobacco and spices and all that kind of stuff. Here he is as a middle-aged man writing, and here he is as an old man writing. And when you live to 83 and you write every day for publication and you're supposed to study his works, you, you cannot read as fast as he wrote. <laughs> I would need to live as old as 83 to have any chance of reading everything he wrote, and I don't think I would. So he kept writing, and um, a lot of his work was to explain this idea of common grace. The eminent British historian Owen Tradwick writes something that could have been written by Kuiper himself. Some of you who studied church history may know that uh, he worked here in Cambridge for many years as a great church historian. He wrote this, the Reformation made all secular life into a vocation of God. It was like a baptism of the secular world. It refused any longer to regard the specially religious calling of a priest or a monk as higher in moral scale than the calling of a cobbler or a prince. Christian energy was turned away from the still and the contemplative towards action. The person who would leave the world turned into the person who would change it. But whether it derived from medieval asceticism or from modern religious philosophy, Kaiser was deeply critical of any attempt to ban religion from the field of the human intellect and confine it to the emotions and the will, thereby excluding it from science and public life. I'm drawing to my conclusion. The Oxford movement the unschooled theology of the rural poor and American revivalism are hardly the most likely places to become locations of deep personal and religious transformation in Kuiper's life. But he was clearly prepared to find and to admit to finding wells of refreshment in spiritual traditions and walks of life quite different from his own. And he was even willing, as a gifted academic theologian, to learn theology from the poor, from people who hardly picked up any book other than the Bible. I think we can learn from that. I think we can also learn from Kuiper the value of seeing Christianity not simply as a matter of the heart, the private realm, but as public truth with the potential to transform every aspect of culture because of Christ's lordship of and dynamic interaction with all of his creation. Kuiper insisted that Christ's work of redemption through his death on the cross had repercussions for the whole of the created order. Everything looks different in the light of the cross, Kuiper would say. That's why Christians are called to engage in what he called 
an architectonic critique of Kaiko. Some of these pictures you can find in a new English uh, pictorial biography. What's better to have a pictorial biography with some text but lots of pictures of Kaiko? That's just been published as well. But this was the word that Kaiko used, an, an architectonic critique, rather than just piecemeal Christian action or voicing a Christian view on a particular issue to actually come with your Christian faith to society as a whole to provide a fundamental critique. And critique in the pure sense of that word critique, which can be positive as well as negative. Affirming what's good, common grace, allows you to confirm what is good in society. But the antithesis, the, the sinfulness and fullness of human beings uh, means that that critique will also be negative. I work a lot with Richard in business. I do think this idea of the affirmation and yet the pointing out of where business is getting it wrong is a very difficult balance to find. And you, you often feel if you're doing one or the other that you're maybe just uh, saying a little bit too strongly because the other side is true as well. So it's, it's critique and affirmation together was Kuiper's view, an architectonic critique, a fundamental critique that's both positive and negative. For Kuiper, such an in but not of the world approach must be passionate in its pursuit of justice and the fight against poverty. It must be determined in upholding both truth and diversity in a way that's often referred to as principled pluralism. And it has to be unrelenting in its practical and intellectual critique of secularism, collectivism, and libertarianism. <coughs> While we cannot draw blueprints from Kuiper's work and thought, these elements provide rich sources of inspiration and reflection. Now my final paragraph, you can hear the end coming. Evangelism and saving souls, from a Kuiperian perspective, is vital and important work to which all Christians are called. But mission that concentrates solely on the spiritual or mystical <coughs> aspect of human life, while ignoring the fact that we humans are social, cultural, and intellectual beings, is one-sided and ineffective mission. Mission that ignores our mandate as Christians to allow scriptural principles to flourish and transform, not only in the church, but also in the world around us even if those who have the power to cause them to flourish and to have transforming effect do not themselves confess the name of Christ. Kuiper was very willing to work with others of different persuasions. He worked with Catholics in government and uh, honoured a place for secularism and socialism and enlightenment ideals. Even though he was uh, attacking them, he was affirming their right to express their view in the public space. So it isn't about social and social and charitable work that it relieves the effects of hunger, sickness, and adversity for which Kuiper will be remembered. What he wished to see, along with all those inspired by his works, is the kingdoms of this world becoming the kingdom of our God. Or as Paul wrote to the Colossians in the glad to finish this talk with a biblical quote and again I've summarized it God was pleased to have all his fullness dwell in him Christ and through him to reconcile all things to himself whether things on earth or things in heaven by making peace through his blood shed on the cross thanks for listening